Okay, I think we, we will start. Um, welcome back. Uh, first of all, a couple of quick questions. Uh, who has a signed account or has not a signed account? So, it's like about, uh, so we are going to start using the cluster probably next Friday. Uh, so today I want to finish the, the first uh, lecture with some slides that remain and then um, I switch a bit the order of, of the syllabus of the schedule so I'm going to discuss a bit about the tools that we need to use for, for actually using the cluster like Linux and Python that is mostly what we are going to use um, next Friday we are going to put our hands on the cluster so it will be nice if you guys can bring a laptop um, so you can actually do the stuff there, there is material today that you can actually follow along with the laptop especially the Python part if you wish but uh, also how familiar are you with Python have you used Python before yeah Linux so so good all right so um, a quick summary from what we discussed last Friday so I talk a bit about scientific computing and then a bit about high performance computing any questions comments concerns something that you would like to raise something that you remember or don't remember anyway we I think we stopped here more or less uh, we were talking about threads versus processes and this, this is mainly um, differentiated when you have a multi-core machine meaning many CPUs so when you have something that you can not necessarily when you have many CPUs but even in one CPU when you had different processes are independent programs running on the same CPU or not uh, while threads run only in one CPU and there are different instances of the same program doing something alike. Examples of this can be done by software using OpenMP, which will pro produce threads, and examples of different processes can be done with MPI, which actually communicates information between these processes. Um, we talk a bit about different architectures as well, uh, ones that may have multiple cores, uh, but they don't have shared memory, and a different kind of architecture that has multiple cores, but they share a big pool of memory. And this scheme here, this, this cartoon thing, uh, try to represent that. The circles are like different processors, and then you have different layers of memory. The, the big, big red square is like the main memory, and then this happens in all the computers, even in your laptops. You have different levels of memory. Sometimes it's called cache, cache level one, cache level two. The closer they are to the processor is the faster this memory is. So the processor can take advantage of that and do computations faster. The thing is that the closer they are to the processor is the smaller they are. Okay, so cache level two is the closest one to the, to the processor. It's actually on the chip itself, but it's very tiny. So you can put some things there, and actually people uh, draw some strategies trying to take advantage of that. Okay? Now, um, one thing that happens in this kind of architecture, and I think we mentioned something about this last Friday, is that programming is, is kind of easy, sort of. Uh, most of the, of the difficulties are hidden in the, in the hardware side. The problem, though, is that you can imagine that uh, if I'm, doing, I'm running a program here and I have a variable or a vector, and then I want to access one element, it can be just one variable, it doesn't need to be a vector. Uh, and I have one of the processors working with that that value and modifying it because it's computing something. The other processor that may want to access exactly the same variable may hit uh, a problem with that, not a problem, but a mismatch in the value, right? So this is known as coherency. So basically, the hardware behind try to, try to take care of this by keeping uh, reliable, reliable copies of the, of the values of the variable, okay? But sometimes it's, it's hard to achieve, especially if you are doing a lot of computations and, and it is very intensive. Uh, you may run into things called race conditions, where you may have values that are being updated by, by one processor, but the value, the latest value, hasn't been updated in the other one. Okay. Um, so that that is also related to uh, what we call data parallelism. Uh, the data has to be distributed across these different processors. I mentioned it's easier to, to program. Uh, it, it allows to have uh, optimizations in the compilation, especially when, when we are dealing with programs that are compiled. As I mentioned, we probably are going to use Python, which is interpreted instead of compiled, but something alike may happen as well. 
uh, one of the nice things of this data parallelism is that the code that you're looking at looks pretty much as serial. I mentioned last Friday that if you want to take the whole advantage of the parallelism of the high performance computing, you, already, you probably will have to change the strategy, the algorithms to take advantage of the hardware. In these cases, when you have a shared memory machine, um, it's, it's, not so, uh, it's not so bad, the situation, and it may look just a pure uh, serial code. Um, there are benefits also from having not too much communications between the codes, because the communication is actually happening uh, through the data itself. So that's, that's is good. The other problem is that there are obvious limitations due to the scaling, because building these machines are quite expensive, so they don't have many, many cores. Uh, and on top of that, as you, when you increase the number of cores, you, try, you also increase the, the risk of having these uh, kind of race conditions into the loop. Um, any questions? So with this, I will, I will move to the next kind of architectures that is combining the ideas of the, of the shared memory machines and the out-of-core machines. Are there any questions about this? No? OK, so the hybrid architectures is probably the, the most used ones. Uh, it combines uh, the shared and the distributed memory approach. And the idea is basically, let's say that you have uh, each of these rest rectangles represents one kind of shared memory. Uh, so they have like four cores and one bank of memory. This is like the, the nodes that we're going to use inside it looks like. You will have eight cores actually sharing 16 gigabytes of RAM. Okay. So you may have eight threads running in one node, and then they may communicate with other nodes uh, through MPI. So it's a combination of OpenMPI for the threading within the node and MPI for passing information outside the node. Um, that implies that there are different levels of parallelism. There is a level of parallelism with the thread within each of the nodes. Um, and then there is a level of parallelism where you communicate the information with the different cores, with the different nodes. Uh, usually, these this kind of systems are called homogeneous. And what it means is each of these nodes are identical, like inside it. The GPC machine inside it is exactly like that. We have nodes with a core each of them, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and then they are duplicated by thousands. So that gives you like the whole cluster. Um, what happens is that people have to start to build these this kind of same ideas, hybrid architectures, but with heterogeneous systems. So it's the same idea as before, but now instead of having just Let's say eight cores, they have eight cores and two CPUs, or two accelerators, FPGA. Okay, so these are kind of hybrid because they mix and match different cores within the node. Uh, they start to be uh, very interesting for, for the community to experiment in these machines because people have claimed that they get a lot of speed up in their code. Okay, I have some examples for that. Um, so what is this heterogeneous computer? Well, I mentioned uh, use different devices uh, concurrently in the same computation. Uh, commonly use a CPU with an accelerator. Uh, it can be a graphic process unit, a GPU. It can be a Xeon 5, which is a kind of uh, Intel modified version of a GPU with a lot of cores, uh, or a field programmable get array, which is something that is pretty cool because it configures the circuit of the chip on the fly, depending on the computation you want to run. Um, what happened here is that usually building these systems are cheaper and depending, this is, this is important, depending on the computation, it may be faster or not. Which is the main issue with, with this hybrid system is that if you are using a, an accelerator or a GPU uh, and you need to do computations with that, that's okay. The problem is how you move the data. Moving the data from the CPU, from this memory pool to the accelerator or to the GPU, it also takes time. And usually, these devices don't have a lot of memory. So the bottleneck in the computation there is, is moving data back and forth. So let's say you had um, a humongous matrix of 100,000 elements, and you want to invert the matrix. GPUs are excellent for doing this kind of computations. It's moving data back and forth from the GPU that, that is usually common. The other thing that is not trivial at all is programming these devices. If you are going to use an accelerator like CO5, you probably would need to use OpenACC, which is sort of similar to OpenMP. That's not so bad. If you are going to use a GPU, uh, then things 
can get a bit more complicated. You probably need to use CUDA uh, or um, Open AC, uh, OpenCS. Uh, so those languages are like fairly hard or low level languages, which are, it takes some, some time to learn. Um, so just to get you familiar with some terminology in the, in the heterogeneous systems, you had a host, which usually is, is one uh, core or, or a CPU with the memory. So this is kind of one node what you usually have in any computer. Uh, you have a device that it can be either a GPU, like in this case, or it can be an accelerator. Okay, so the host basically is where you plug all the things. You will have the, the central process unit, the CPU, and then one of these devices there. Okay, um, the GPUs are usually called, or, or sometimes called GP, GPU for general purpose graphic processing units. Uh, something that you probably want to be aware of is that people had reported humongous speed ups, like even 50 times the speed up in the code. And the thing that I want to, to emphasize is that this is very problem dependent. Not all the problems, not all the codes will scale like that. Okay, so usually you, you need to take this like with a grain of salt. Okay. Um, the speed up may depend on the, on the problem structure. Um, you need to have many, many, many operations at the same time that has to be done several times. Remember, we're using basically devices that are good for rendering images or, or, or lighting pixels in a screen. That is what a GPU does. So even, um, even the, the precision uh, in which your computation is done is important there. So GPUs, because they do that, they render things uh, on the screen. Let's, let's say you're playing a game and you are seeing something moving, a fluid or, or whatever, uh, it's not important that the precision is very accurate. But when you're doing a computation, you may be interested in keeping your precision as high as possible. So GPUs have this single versus double precision uh, distinction. So they are very good and very very fast with single precision. Double precision, it may depend on the model of the GPU that you're using. Data locality refers to this uh, motion of transporting data between the host and the GPU. Okay? Uh, I mentioned this, I think, these things are kind of related. You need to be uh, knowledgeable about the hardware that you are using and, and invest a good amount of time in programming to achieve the best performance of the device. Any, any questions about this? Okay, let me, let me talk about something else that people is, is, is some people is talking about recently or, or lately, uh, which is, <laughs> sorry? <laughs> Good question, no, perfect, I agree. I, uh, uh, yes, I, I, I'm including on this just one slide, I, I agree with you, I had the same feeling. I don't think this is under HPC, but nowadays I think people take the term HPC in a, in a broader way, right? Uh, so the, the thing I want to mention here is what people call cloud or grid computing. So they are kind of similar, but different at the same time. So grid computer, uh, basically you can say that take a collection of resources and try to tackle a specific, a specific problem. Examples of this are, for instance, if you have ever used uh, SETI at home, Einstein at home, even LHC computing grid, where basically you have distribute um, resources across the globe and you share something. It doesn't need to be computational specifically. It can be storage, for instance. It can be a reservoir of data. It can be um, replicas of data, right? Uh, the, the, the key point is that they are not administered, administered centrally, so they are not localized in a particular place. They have to keep some standards so the communication is possible. Um, and initially, they, they achieve a, a non-trivial quality service. So basically, they, they produce redundancy for data, or even if it is computation, like if you ever use SETI at home or less than at home, uh, they, they, they actually try to um, use the screensavers to compute while, they, while your computer is not doing it, okay? Um, as, as Pekka mentioned, I, I, I don't think this falls under the category of HPC, but certainly you can, you can get results and you can get things done. The other one that has been, um, like a buzzword lately is, is cloud computing. And the difference is like 
or main difference are that usually is a share of poor configurable computing resources that usually are centralized, okay? So the main thing is that you connect to this service and you request, okay, I want to run this computation in this kind of architecture and the virtualization, the power of the new CPUs allow you to virtualize that environment and simulate the kind of architecture where you want to run and there you are, okay? So basically, it's related to virtualization. Most of these services are, they have a cost, like Amazon Cloud, I think Microsoft has another cloud. Compute Canada has two clouds, East and West. I'm not sure why the division, because it's a cloud, so who cares? Uh, but initially, <coughs> uh, if you had a Compute Canada account, if you are a researcher, you should be able to, to access those. So examples of these are, well, probably all, everyone is, is familiar with iCloud, Dropbox, if you wish, is some sort of, of uh, system like that. Amazon Cloud, the Microsoft Azure, PMS, and Compute Canada is and West Cloud. Okay. As I say, I'm not saying these are HPC resources, but I felt the you know need to mention. Right. And remember when we when we start discussing about what is HPC, we say, well, you need HPC in different situations. If you need to tackle a very big problem, if you need to deal with large amount of data, like in this case, uh, and, and it's somehow also related to this divide and conquer uh, idea, if you wish. Okay. Um, so, uh, a bit more on the on the software side um, and related to the parallelism. And this is something that is, I, I just want to mention this, and I'm sorry that this, uh, these two lectures are going to be a bit more theoretical. I promise next next uh, Friday, we will start to put, probably today maybe, start to put our hands on, on the cluster. Um, but basically, I want you to keep in mind that, and I actually wish, uh, I didn't ask your permission, but I hope you allow me to use your uh, Python code from the advanced uh, statistics module to, to take as an example. Um, we, can, we will see that it's, it's, uh, there are different problems and different ways in which um, a program or, or an algorithm can be tackled from the parallelism point of view. And it goes from easy to very hard, okay? So an easy uh, problem is when you have what is called perfect parallelism and it's when you have independent computation. Let's say you want to perform some computations and you have parameters and you can vary the parameter space, uh, cover a parameter space where all the computations are independent because you are solving the equations with different parameters and you can run that in parallel. Um, the, the bottom, which is an asynchronous parallelism, is when all the computations are entangled. One computation depends on the other and vice versa. So it's impossible to, to unentangle uh, that set of computations, so they need to be waiting and communicating back and forth each other. In the middle, you have uh, something like pipeline parallelism that they can overlap sequentially. So when one is done, the next one starts, and maybe there is one that can be running in parallel, but it's not completely parallel like the perfect parallelism. And then you have something like synchron synchronous parallelism, which is parallel world that can be well synchronized. So at the same time, the same, all the processes are doing some computation, they reach a point, they communicate, and keep going very well synchronized. So this is kind of the spectrum that you may find. And I think we are going to start from the perfect parallelism and show something kind of synchronous or asynchronous um, in the fourth or fifth lecture, okay? Um, related to that is the concept of granularity, which measures the amount of uh, processing performed before the communication is needed. So when you have a very fine grain uh, parallelism program, there is constant communication necessary. Uh, when it is perfect parallelism, there is no communication necessary at all. Okay? And in the middle, you may have coarse grain, which is some significant computation can be performed before any communication happens. Again, I will try to, to emphasize this when we see uh, examples. 
Um, I think we mentioned this, and, and, and this is getting close to the end so that we can switch gears to the tools. Uh, the languages, when, when if, if you program uh, any serial code, it can be done in C, C++, Fortran, uh, Python, R, if you wish. Uh, when you need to use threads, like in the case of uh, shared me memory machines, you can use OpenMP or ppthread, for instance. When you need to pass messages between different nodes, you can use MPI, PCAS, um, QRA Fortran. Uh, for accelerators, I think I mentioned, you have CUDA, OpenCL, OpenACC. Um, so different languages depending on, on the hardware as well. Um, yeah, so this is what usually is called the high performance computer software stack. It means which kind of tools, which kind of software programs you will need to use. At the very bottom or at the very top of the list, depending how you want to see it, is uh, the environment. And this is all, all the HPC systems across the world, they use uh, Linux. One flavor or another, but it's all based on Linux. It means a black terminal where you're, or white terminal, depending on your configuration, but something where you're going to be typing commands, okay? There is no GUI. Uh, you may have some feedback as graphics, but usually it's all command, command driven. Um, the other thing that is important, and we're going to be playing with this, is that all these systems are, are based on a queue system. Uh, it basically is not like in your computer, you have your program, you press run, or, or, or you type the command and it runs. It goes through a queue. And when there are resources that are available for your program to run, depending on what you requested, the program will run. So it has to wait there. Uh, so it has to be automatized to run as well. It doesn't, it cannot have the interaction of a user. So if you need to set values for the program to run, you need to do it in a way that you can pass as an argument or a parameter for it. Okay, we're going to see that as well. Um, <coughs> most of the systems, they use something called a module system, which allow you to load the particular software that you want to use. As you can imagine, we have like 100, no, maybe not 100, but 10,000 users on Signet, and each of them, each group uses different class of software, different programs. So we cannot have, we have all installed, but not all of them can be accessible at the same time. Otherwise, there will be conflict. They may use similar, similar names or similar variables that are being loaded. So for selecting what programs you need to use, you need to tell the system which, which modules you want to load. We are going to, to play with that as well. And at the end, something that relates hardware and software is uh, the file system. And the file system is basically what allows you to access your files, your programs, uh, save data, read data, etc. right? So for, for the cluster to be efficient and, and well-behaved, sharing these resources with all the nodes, you need a particular file system. And this is, uh, there are two flavors mainly. One is a general purpose file system, GPFS, or Luster. Uh, the one that we use is GPFS, and what it means is all the nodes on the cluster are seeing the same files at the same time. And this is very challenging. If you, if you think about it, is we are talking about 30 plus thousand cores accessing one file or one directory or a set of directories at the same time is, is quite a, a demanding task to do and the file system handle is pretty well. There are recommendations to help the file system. We are going to see some of them, uh, but usually it works well. So this is more or less what we, what we have discussed last Friday and today. Um, any questions about this? Oh, all right. So, Let's move into the scientific computing and HPC tools. And, and I include here very broadly and very uh, briefly uh, Linux and Python. So um, yeah, so this is what I'm explaining for today. Uh, I practically am going just to mention some features of Linux, but the, the actual review and playing with the commands will happen when we start to connect to the, to the cluster. Um, so what is a shell, for, for those of you of, or who haven't played with it, is if you want to think about this, it's like another program, but it's a super program, it has super powers. What basically allows you is to run other programs within this, okay? Um, 
as I say, most of the of the clusters across the world, they use this this kind of of, of way to control the programs that you run, and and they may be, they may be a Mac, they may be a terminal running on, on on Windows or any flavor of Linux, but actually, if you think about this, um, you are very familiar with this kind of shell or super programs, and this is an example. And I took a screenshot of my BlackBerry, so maybe this is not familiar for you, but this is this like an iPhone, but it's better. Oh, I'm being recorded. <laughs> Take it down. Anyway, um, but but basically, the, you know, when you control your phone, it's basically like telling uh, the phone which programs you want to run, and it's basically the same thing, right? The only thing is that instead of moving something here, you need to tie the whole thing and be very careful because otherwise the computer will not understand. Okay, so um, basically, the, the the truth is that no one uses graphic user interface or GUIs. Uh, in HPC. Um, why? Because HPC is Unix or Linux based uh, and doesn't have a GUI. Uh, if, you, if you start Linux in your computer, you may have a, a, a GUI, uh, GNOME, KDE, MATE, uh, but initially in, in the cluster, you need to connect through a terminal and, and there is no way. If you use, I never use the cloud, I don't know if you have GUIs there, I imagine you might. Uh, Yes. So even in the cloud system where it may be a bit more friendly, at the end of the day you end up in one of these black or white terminals typing things. Uh, why is this? Uh, well, the earliest supercomputer, if you wish, were based on Unix. And, and as I say, the, the, the most natural way to control uh, this machine is through the terminal. And actually it's not just that, it's, it's the most powerful way that you have to control the computer. With the, with the GUI, with the mouse, you can go and click on things and, and get things done quickly, sort of, but you can do only the things that allow you the menus to do. If you want to do something else that is not specified in the user interface, there's no way that you can achieve that. The only way is go back to the terminal and, and, and ask the computer to do whatever you want to do there. Um, the other thing is that when you use GUIs, and you may notice this in your computer sometimes, depending on, on what kind of tasks you are doing. Uh, they consume more memory, and they are a bit slower than the response that you get from the terminal, okay? Because there are programs running, interpreting what you try to do with the, with the mouse, uh, refreshing the displays, uh, the graphics that you are looking at. Especially, this is very true when you are connected over the network. Uh, so the response, it may, be, it may get even, even uh, slower. Yeah, so the bottom line is, if you want to use an HPC system across the world, you will have to get familiar with these terminals. Um, so just to compare a bit more the GUIs with, with the command line interface, um, they are very good, the GUIs are very good at operating an existing system, they are good at uh, using existing functionalities. Um, the programs tend to have a lot of functionalities built into the, the, the GUIs, um, uh, but this is something that is concatenated or, or, or set to do something specific. Um, they are easy to learn, they, um, but they are, they are difficult to use for big, big tasks when, when you have several steps across the, the values. On the other hand, the command line interfaces, uh, basically you can think about them as a blank canvas. They are there for you to define whatever you want to do. Um, they are good for creating new things. Uh, the commands that you use, they are very simple actually. They, do, they are very good in doing just one simple task. The power of the interface is that you can concatenate these commands and create your own pipeline. So it's completely flexible in that way. It can be hard to learn. Uh, there is a, a, a maybe sort of a steep learning curve, but after you, you get used to it, it gets easier and easier. The other thing that is very, very useful, and we're going to do and, and see this, is that you can create what is called a script, which is uh, it's basically a text file where you put all the commands that you do, and you can repeat that. It's like writing a very simple program with the commands that the, the shell will interpret for you and can be reused several times, as many times as you want. 
Okay. So <laughs> these are some clients, some sort of uh, shell, shell uh, terminals that you can use depending on the operating system. So if you are in Windows, you can use Mobex term, Sigwin, Git bash. These are just um, sort of emulators of terminals if you want to practice in Windows. Uh, if you are in Mac, there is a, because Mac OS is based on, on, on a flavor of Linux, there is a native uh, shell, which is the one that you access with the terminal. Uh, if you don't have it in your dock, just go to Applications, Utility, and Terminal. And then Linux, there are tons of different shells that you can use. Okay. Um, what happens is when you, when you click in one of these terminals, a shell, which is the super program that interprets whatever you type there, is launched. Uh, and this is what you are interacting with. So the shell will provide access to files, to the network, to other programs, basically words that you type commands. Uh, the shell will read and interpret them. It will tell you if it finds the command or not and perform an action based on the command that you have typed. Uh, the most common, uh, common use shell nowadays is bash, but there are others like C shell, Z shell. Um, depending on which one you use, some things change, but they're slightly, so it's not, not a, a huge uh, problem. Um, what happened when you open the, the, let me see if I can, we have, uh, this is another bar another variant. If you have Windows 10, you may have, what is this called? Bash? Ubuntu Bash. It's some sort of Frankenstein project started by Windows that basically provides you Linux. So that thing there, that blinking tiny line, is what we call the cursor. And then in front is the prompt. And it sometimes it gives you information. So depending on what kind of, um, of system are you using or, or program are you using, uh, MobX term encapsulates uh, the username and the name of the computer between square brackets, and this is the prompt. Max usually looks like the name of the computer till the username dollar sign. Um, in a Linux machine, some sort of combination depending if you have configured the prompt or not. The universal sign for the prompt is the dollar sign. So when you have a dollar sign, it basically means you are in a command line prompt. Okay. I put some uh, link here on a crash course on Linux shell, um, but we are going to see more commands and more, more detailed examples uh, next time when, when we actually connect to the cluster and start to play with it. And this is kind of a cheat sheet with the most useful commands you may, you may find. Okay. Any questions about this? I didn't want to go too much into detail, but basically what we are going to do when we use uh, the Linux shell is changing directory. That is like locating our cell in the, in the folder, if you wish, where our beta is or where our, or where our program needs to run, and then manipulate some files and those some things like that. And this, this commands kind of summarize that, okay? So the commands are in white, and the arguments, which are mostly file names, are in sort of red code. I promise you we will, we will come back to this uh, later. Now I'm going to move um, a bit into the programming side with uh, a very, very quickly and just introduction to Python. So some of you may, may feel bored. But basically in a, in a nutshell, what's why we use um, program, programming languages to actually tell the computer what we want to do, right? The computer per se is kind of silly. It's just know to repeat things after you tell the computer what to do, otherwise it won't do anything. And the main difference I want to emphasize in, in programming languages are that there are languages that are compiler and, and others that are interpret. And um, basically the compilers, uh, what does is take your code that you have written and generates an optimized set of instructions that the computer can understand. Uh, the language is, is basically for us, for knowing how to express what we want the computer to do. Uh, the executable that is generated by the compiler can be run in the computer after the compilation is done. And there are several stages. Python, which is the one that we are going to be playing with here, is an interpreted kind of language. It means that it reads each of the lines of your code and executes uh, that line immediately. Okay, so there is no compilation. It's just 
a set of commands that are read and executed line after line. Okay. Um, I think we are going to be using Python 2.7. Uh, there is a version Python 3, but yeah, it's not it's not 100% compatible between one and each other. So uh, we, I think we will stick with Python 2.7. There is in my examples, I don't think there is uh, much of a deal with that, but that's just to, to let you know. Um, just a kind of quick review about programming. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw that. These are like I don't know, the very first <laughs> uh, way that you set a program or write a program, but these are like punch cards, the way, old way that people used to, to program or tell a computer what to do. Um, but basically, the, it's, it's the same idea. It's, it's, um, it's telling um, the computer exactly what you want to do. Okay? And there is this kind of ecosystem of ideas between algorithm, a program, or code, and the software. Okay? It's all interconnected somehow. Uh, and and, and the borders of the limits are, are a bit vague somehow. Okay. Um, a quick review. Uh, most of programming languages have some basic building blocks, like looping constructors, conditionals, uh, to handle decision making, and the ability of group commands into functions or modules. This is, this is very important, especially when you want to reuse your code one and more time. Um, sort of if you wish that programming or, or coding is, is based on recycled principles of reusability and modularity. Um, reuse pieces, your pieces of code, create new models based on previous codes. Um, and, and, and all of these languages need some sort of interface that allow them to, to do that. Um, so let's, let's jump into Python. Um, Python is a very flexible and mature uh, a scripting style is like 20 plus years old. It's what is called a high level language. It's not like C or Fortran, which is a low level language. Uh, one of the good things or, or, or very powerful thing is that it's free to use, it's open source. It's sort of ubiquitous in the sense that it may run on Windows, Linux, or Mac. Um, it has a humongous set of libraries um, because it has, it has grown so much that is, is one of the uh, very uh, important points or very strong points of, of Python is that there are a lot of contributing modules, but also it has been debugged by the community itself because a lot of people use it. Um, in, the in the side uh, of the performance, it's, it's way slower than C or Fortran or even other interpreter languages, uh, but, but it, does, it does work. Um, as I mentioned, there is a Python 3 language. Um, you may wonder why there is a Python 3 and a Python 2 at the same time living. Well, I'm guessing it's that because people have, haven't feel comfortable enough doing the switch between one another. And there are a lot of number of packages uh, in Python 2 that hasn't been ported to Python 3. So something that you need to be aware when you decide to stick to one of these versions to, to develop your code. Um, if you don't have any IDE, an integrated development environment, I would suggest to you to use Anaconda, uh, in particular because it comes with something that is called the Jupyter Notebook that allows you to run not only Python, but also Julia, which is another scripting language, and R. And, and when you download and install Anaconda, it brings, it brings the Jupyter Notebook with you. Um, basically, it's based in, in this IPython thing, which is an interactive version of Python. It behaves mostly like a notebook kind of thing. I don't know if anyone has used Mathematica or Maple. It's that kind of flavor. You type a command, and there is an inline mode that it basically shows the results. Um, it's Python with some extra add-ons there. Okay. Uh, it's nice for exploration. If you are typing things, and you actually quickly want to see what is going on there, it's, it, it works for that. So this is uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it basically, the, the other nice thing is that it runs the interface in your web browser. So you start an Anaconda, and you just type the directory where you have installed uh, Anaconda, Jupyter, Space Notebook, and it will pop up an interface for you in the browser. Um, let me see. I think I have some, yeah. So it basically will look like that. 
It has a file explorer there. Uh, it has other tabs where you can uh, go and click. In particular, if you go to Conda, it allows you to manage packages and install packages that you may need. Uh, you have a text editor. If you go in, in new, uh, you can click on text file for the terminal. Um, it has a variety of options. And this is how it looks like when you start a new notebook. And basically, you type your commands here. And next line, you press Shift Enter for, for executing that line, and you get the output. Has anyone used Jupyter? OK, so well, that's something new. You can try it. Well, what, what do you guys oh, use for Python? I play. play. Uh, anyone using Canopy? Spider? Pure Python in the terminal. Good, perfect. All right. So and this is how it looks like. So you print some code, hello world. It basically says hello world, and it returns you the control with the, with the next line. Um, let's do a quick, very quick uh, review of, of basic Python. And probably I can go quickly here, especially because most of you have experience. But uh, so you can define variables on the flyer, as in many of the scripting languages, uh, like R and Python. Um, you don't need to declare them. You can actually uh, switch the ties by redefining the variable. Um, operations are straightforward, like X plus Y, you have to find X and Y, it, be, it will basically return what you expect from, from the arithmetic, multiplications, divisions. So that is very, very natural if you wish. Um, with respect to variable types, there are five standard data types, uh, numbers, which can be integers, long, floats, or complex numbers. Uh, you have uh, strings uh, that are defined by single or double quotation. Uh, you have lists, which are defined by uh, squares. And the nice thing of this is that you can combine different types of the standard type. It can be a string, it can be a number, whatever. Uh, you have tuples, uh, which are defined by, by parentheses. And the thing of tap or the, the, the strong thing of tuples is that they are read-only, if you wish. They cannot be modified. So they say a bit of memory if you are looking into the, the, the memory side. And one of the uh, most important types in Python is the dictionaries uh, that allow you to assign keys with a value. So I can define a key and assign a label or, or a value to the label that I use. Okay, so if I ask for the dictionary uh, W of S, I will get an I, W of P, I will, I will get an LS. Um, the other thing that we're going to be using, and, and especially when you do scientific computing and you do any kind of computation, we, know, we all know that vectors or arrays are very useful. The thing with Python is that this, because it's so general purpose, uh, it doesn't have a, a real vector array type predefined. Um, but there is this, this uh, very useful package called NumPy, numerical Python, that, automatic, that automatically defines arrays for you. And it's included when you include PyLab. Ish, ish, ish. Um, so NumPy is, is the main package used uh, behind any scientific computation, any, any kind of computation that you may want to use. Uh, so you, you only need to do import NumPy or from NumPy import star or the functionalities that you want to, to use, and you get arrays uh, by doing that. Okay? And you can define uh, one-dimensional arrays. You can define two-dimensional arrays by matrices. So this is just a summary of, of the main packages that you may want to use, especially when doing computations. Uh, well, NumPy, I mentioned. SciPy brings a lot of um, high-level routines for linear algebra, Fourier transform, matrix computi computation, uh, optimization. All kind of, of goodies are there. We are going to play with some of them. And then with the other one that we are going to play in the visualization module in particular, plus other ones is matplotlib that will allow you to do a lot of plotting and a and, and nice visualization. Okay. Other data types in, in Python, uh, well, tuples I mentioned, dictionaries I mentioned, they are, uh, they are very interesting because this key value pairing um, 
of such things. The other thing that you may want to know is that Python is, is an object-oriented language. So you can define objects and all the, the, the features or, or functionalities associated with objects like polymorphism, uh, inheritance, uh, you can define classes, all kind of things. Um, the other one that we are going to explore in the data or big data modules is pandas, which uh, allow you to define something like records or a spreadsheet, if you wish. It's called data frames. Um, it's very similar to Excel tables or, or data frames in R, if any, anyone has used R. Um, basically, you have columns, you have names for the columns, and, and there is a lot of, of uh, powerful functions that you can appress for, for process this, uh, these columns in, in in, in, in one shot, basically. It's, it's on a, some sort of vector, vectorization operations implemented that make things very, very efficient. Uh, how, uh, as I mentioned, most of the programming language has these features, and of course, Python has how to do loops in Python. Um, basically, Python will loop uh, over a list of items. Uh, so every time that you want to do a loop, if you uh, if you want to repeat from 0 to 10 or to 9, you basically need to define a, a range, which is given by the X range function. Um, Python, because it's based on C, start indexing on 0 instead of 1, uh, as, as Fortran does. So when I do X range of 10, it will give me a set of 10 numbers starting on 0 until 9. Um, so by doing 4i in X range of 10, I will get one of these values for i, and it's going to be printing i, so that's the sequence that you get. Okay. If something is not clear, I'm going to pass, just stop me and ask. Um, I'm trying to cover this, so we can start just with the, with the intro next class. Um, yep. yep. Good question. So uh, range will actually allocate um, a piece of memory for, for generating this vector. Um, X range basically generates on the fly and doesn't allocate the memory. Python 3, there is one that is not available. Do you remember which one? Right. Yeah. So you don't have X range on Python 3. So that's one of the things that you need to, aware, to be aware, aware when you switch from three. Uh, of course, that's one of the other things we mentioned. It will allow you to define functions. Uh, you basically need to use the keyword def, the name of the function, and then between parentheses the arguments, like a square num will return the square of x. And basically, it, it works as expected. It returns the type of the argument that you are passing or the operation that is computing and returning. Um, what else? Yes, uh, if else or, or conditionals. Uh, there is an if else statement as in any, any language is, is basically if the condition. Uh, notice that and you if you have used python you know this very well notice that python is very picky with indentation so you need to be very respectful of the spaces otherwise python will understand and will will complain um, so in this case uh, define the function even or odd uh, of an integer and ask if the reminder of the division of n over 2 is equal to zero then it prints even else it prints odd and basically you call us as expected Um, <coughs> functions is half, uh, halfway through to the modules uh, idea. Basically, I can define a function in my notebook or in my section, but if I want to use this function in different programs or in different sections, how I do that? Well, you can save this function in a, in a file, my mod.py, for instance, uh, and then import the name of the file. Uh, if you use this uh, triple quotation mark here, um, this is called doc string. And if you do help of the function, it will basically tell you what you have written in the comments. So that is a very good idea, nice thing to document for, for the users or other colleagues that want to use your functions. Um, 
notice that when you want to execute a function that has been imported from one file or a module, you say the name of the file dot and the name of the function. Unless that you have done something like from my mod.pi import uh, my fun as and you give a new name. So you rename the function. Um, and basically it works as, as, as it is. In this case, it's returning the uh, square sum of two uh, numbers. Um, so you put the argument and then either you, you execute the function and get the value or print the value assigned to the function. Comments in Python are, are done with the number sign or hashtag. So again, it's, it's a good idea to document all, all the functions of the programs, especially if, if it is complicated uh, even more. So. Um, we are going to see this more with examples, but by using uh, the arrays, we can do something which is called slicing, which is selecting quantities from the array. So in this case, I'm defining an array from one to six. If I ask the element two, I get three. Remember that element zero is the first one. Element one is the second one. Element two, in this case, will be the third one. Okay. Uh, if I do the array and, and column here, I get the whole array. Uh, if I do from one to three, I will get from the second up to the third, but not the third. Um, and you can do stripes as well. You can do from one to six, every two, uh, and that's what you get. Um, plotting, as I mentioned, we're going to do plotting with Matplotlib, um, but basically it's, it's very straightforward as well. So as a simple example here, one array, uh, I compute y being x squared, uh, and then you plot x comma y comma and then you give an argument for saying what kind of plot you want. In this case, is red dots connected with a, with a straight line. Okay. One thing that you will notice is every time that you do some plotting, my, um, Python will respond with this sort of meshak, message, and it's basically a pointer to the object, to the graphic object that you are generating. Okay. In the notebook, there are different options that we're going to explore later uh, to visualize this automatically, but initially it says all what is graphic in this kind of object. And sometimes, if you want to visualize it, you need to do something like um, push the object through the buffer, and, and, and then it's going to be displayed. Um, there are different ways to, to create plots. Um, and this is an, another way to create an array. So line space generates an array from the first argument up to the second with this number of points, from, from 0 to 2 pi with 75 points. And I, I compute sine of x and sine of 2x. And then you can plot one line with green up triangles connected with dashes, and then another one with blue dots. Okay? And again, each of these steps has an object of, uh, associated. And when you push the plot through, it will basically look like that. Um, <coughs> Uh, files. We're going to see this in more detail again, but you, of course you have uh, the features of saving text file, pure text file, or serving binary uh, file, or in particular some sort of uh, standard formats file like NextCDF. Um, this is very important, especially if you are sharing data with collaborators to have a standard where, because the metadata, the data about your data is also included in the file. Um, the other thing that you need to be aware, and it's related to the HPC part here, and in particular to the file system that we use, is that usually, in general, uh, these input-output operations, reading or saving files, are usually the slowest parts in the computation. So optimizing these things are, are, are crucial for having high performance in your code. Um, OK, I think I'm close to my last slide. So. One thing that you will notice, especially if you, if you want to try the Jupyter notebook, is that this generates a notebook. So how you move from, from the notebook to a scripts, that is actually what we will be running on the cluster. Um, well, basically, you, you, one of the things that you need to be aware of is that a lot of features and, and, and nice things that in the notebook are automatically loaded for you in the script when you use pure Python, they may not. And this you fix by loading PyLab which brings one, many of these, of these features. Um, the other thing that you may want to be aware, especially when doing graph, 
or plotting is that in the notebook, some of these things will appear or pop up for you automatically. If you are doing um, Python on the terminal or the console, you probably want to use or draw or show or pause, which actually flashes this buffer and actually allow you to visualize uh, the plots. I think this is, this is it for today. I have a link for uh, more material about Python if you want to review it. This is our introduction to scientific computing with Python. Um, but as I say, next, next Friday, um, if you feel like, like playing with these things, bring a laptop. Uh, those of you who have a signed account, you, you should be ready to go. If not, I, I, I have some temporary accounts that we can use. Uh, but uh, we will start to do the stuff on the class. Any questions? But I'm posting the slides on the course website. Um, I hope that everyone has that. So.